Can machines think? This was computer science pioneer Alan Turing's question in 1950 at the dawn of artificial intelligence. The thing to remember is computers were giant room-based vacuum tube devices, but they were doing things that humans were doing, particularly breaking codes, solving math problems. So they started to think, can this go further than that? What can they do that humans could do? Can they do what humans can do? Alan Turing came up with what he called the imitation game. We later called it the Turing test. But to determine if machines can think, don't we need to define intelligence? No one could really just agree on what the definition of intelligence was. And he said, no, 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 it's not important. It's all about behavior. Can they do what humans can do? Put simply, the Turing test places a computer in one room and a human in another room. Then a researcher asks questions to both, and if the researcher can't tell the difference between the human and computer, then the computer is displaying human intelligence. And if we think humans are intelligent, then we must think computers are intelligent as well. Could you tell me why you joined computer dating? I thought it would be a good way to meet some new people, and especially some people that we were uh, supposed to be compatible with. If things look a little confused here, tonight is the first time an entire theater audience has been brought together by the use of computers. You might ask, well, can we beat the Turing test? I think in many ways we, are, we can beat the Turing test. The Turing test was kind of a starting point in the discussion, the conversation, to get us thinking about what computers can do and how they might be able to do it. Um, but ultimately, the Turing test is very superficial. If it looks like a human, it must be smart. The idea of the Turing test was to find out if computers were capable of human behaviors like doing math, playing chess, and chit-chatting. We were focusing on these very, very narrow tasks. And that was our definition for the end game of what artificial intelligence would be for a very long time. We have reasonably good self-driving cars. We have chess programs. We have programs that can play computer games. But they're not the same artificial intelligence. They're not general. They can't do more than one thing. But that's begun to change over the last decade. We have started to see larger, more powerful technologies that are capable of doing many things simultaneously. We're starting to see some broadness, uh, although broadness may be in language. I still don't think we see you know, things driving cars and talking and telling poetry. But we start to see some of the hints that um, we are starting to understand how to build broader technologies. As artificial intelligence evolves and behaves in more convincingly human ways, it's critical that we don't forget that machines are not humans. We're going to see these systems be fragile in lots of ways that are very different from the way humans are fragile. And we're going to see them excel in lots of ways that maybe humans are not good at excelling. And so I think ultimately they're going to be different from us. And the question will be, how do we take advantage of the things that they're really good at without falling into the traps of the places where they trick us because they seem really good, but they're actually not very good? Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.